place to go. Uh, so there is a uh, kind of Christian-y, churchy phrase uh, that I've heard in my life. Maybe you've heard it too. Uh, and the phrase goes like this, uh, that religion is spelled do, D-O. Uh, and the idea behind that is that uh, for a lot of people, when they think of uh, religion, whatever religious system they might happen to be looking at, uh, their thought is that religion is kind of this like to-do list, and uh, what religion makes you do is that you have to like accomplish all of these different things, and if you accomplish all of them uh, perfectly or even mostly, then, then if you do enough, then maybe it will help you get to the good place someday, whatever that means in that particular religion, uh, or maybe if there's like some uh, animosity between you and the, you know, kind of God, whatever that is, then if you do the right things, then it will break down those barriers, and that's what religion is, and so it's this constant like go, 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 work, work, work. Uh, and so then the phrase goes that if that's what religion is, then Christianity is spelled like this, done. That Christianity is about something that is not about something that we have to do. It's about something that has already been accomplished. Uh, and for sure, I want to be clear as we are beginning today, there is a huge part about that little phrase that is 100% true. Uh, that so much of what Christianity is, is about this message that we call the gospel, that we proclaim about something that has been done, that God has come down to earth, and that as God taught, as God lived, as God did miracles, as God eventually died on the cross and resurrected, something has happened in our midst, and that is so much of what Christianity is all about. Uh, and over the last little bit, uh, we've especially been looking at the idea of the cross. Uh, and last week, we looked at a, a handful of stories that Jesus told. They're found in Luke 15. And we said these stories do a great job of showing us exactly what God is like and to a big extent, what God has done. Uh, that the story is not that God is somewhere over there and we're over here and we have to try to figure out a way to get to God, but that God's presence has been with us, and so much of what we need to do is we need to recognize that God has always been there, and it's God who's always the one who's pursuing us. Uh, so again, if you were with us last week, we looked at a handful of stories, and we see said God is kind of like a shepherd who went, and he was the one who left the 99 and would do whatever he could to find his lost sheep. Uh, we said that Jesus, uh, that God, is like a woman who would do whatever it took, would search all night, would burn valuable oil so that it could find its lost coin. Uh, we said that God is like a father who would go after his rebellious son, his son that had squandered half of the family's money, his son that had put him through so much pain, and that the father would run after this son and would give compassion to his son. Uh, and we said, on the other hand, that God is like a father who his kind of self-righteous, angry son who's sitting outside refusing to go into the party, uh, refusing to grant the same level of forgiveness that he is offering to his other son, that for that son too, the father goes out. It's the father has done something and pleads with him to come back in. And over and over again, the message of Christianity is about something that God has done. And for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the idea of the cross. And so much of what we celebrate and why we gather around a table each week is because we believe that God has done something on the cross that grants us salvation from sins, that there's something that happened on the cross that gives us a pathway where we don't have to continue in our sinful lifestyle anymore, but we can actually be transformed. And there's something that happened on the cross that allows us to be forgiven of our sins. And the cross shows us that nothing we could ever do is enough to separate us from God. God's forgiveness will always win. And all of that is true. But here's the rub I want to talk about today, is that if, uh, as we've been talking about, our orthodoxy affects our orthopraxy, 
Uh, if what we really believe affects how we live, then that means if you believe that religion is all about something that you do, then that's going to, if you believe that, then that's going to affect, and you're just going to feel like it's all about your effort, and that's going to end up burning you out, and some of you have experienced that, and that's not good. But also, if you believe that Christianity is all about something that has been done on your behalf, then how it can work out is that if Christianity is all about something that is done, then therefore, that means I don't have to do anything. And what can happen is that folks can gather in rooms like this or in the room next door and rooms all over the world, and they can get together and they can listen to a message about things that God has done. They can learn about things that God has done. They can sing songs about things that God has done. They can at some level celebrate and remember things that Christ has done. And then they leave and they don't do anything different than anybody else. Uh, there's a Catholic priest uh, named Brendan Manning, and a couple years ago he said this famous statement. He said, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, who at some level have acknowledged that Jesus has done something, that Jesus is something. But then they walk out the door and they deny him by their lifestyle. Or their life just kind of looks like everybody else. They're, they're, they look the same. they're handling their finances, their marriages, their parenting, the way in which they go about making decisions in life. Their priorities just don't look that much different than anybody else. And this is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. And what we want to kind of wrestle with today is if the message of religion and Christianity isn't just about a bunch of stuff that we do, and if Christianity, it cannot all just be tied up in something that is done and therefore we don't have to do anything, what is the kind of complete message? Uh, and so, one day, uh, Jesus uh, was walking and performing miracles, and he was doing it in the presence of, uh, sorry, Belief equals action. I had a good point there. I skipped. Okay. As one day Jesus started on his way, uh, and a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, and if you've been with us uh, by this point, hopefully we're starting to change your mind map a little bit. And when you see the world, word eternal life, you don't necessarily think just of something that's going to happen someday after we die, uh, but you're starting to rethink and know that it's asking, how can I live the life of heaven? How can I live in the life of the kingdom? How can I live this life that apparently, Jesus, you seem to be living in? What must I do to, in to live in that right now and continue forever? Uh, and in my world of church growing up, maybe in some of your world church growing up, there's a right answer to this question. And the right answer to the question is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? No, you don't have to do anything. It's already been done for you. And I get that. And there's truth in that answer. But that's not how Jesus answers right now. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus looked at him and loved him. He said, you want to inherit eternal life? Well, one thing you lack, he said, go and sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. You want to experience eternal life? You want to experience heaven? You want to experience the treasure that's, that, that I'm experiencing right now? Well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to radically reprioritize, redirect the way in which you are handling your finances. To which you might say, so, so that's it? So that, that's, the, that's the thing we have to do? If we want to experience eternal life, we have to like just radically rethink our money? Yes. And you have to follow me. And so what does it mean to follow Jesus? 
For us to inherit eternal life, what does it mean for us to be people that decide that we want to follow Jesus? Uh, another time, uh, Jesus uh, was doing a meal with some of his closest disciples. Uh, we often call it the Last Supper. This is right before Jesus was going to be crucified. And he's gathering with his disciples and kind of this really amazing thing. Uh, when they walked into the room, uh, there was not a servant who would wash their feet, which would have been standard in that day. And so Jesus took the role of a servant, took out a, off his outer garment, and then he bent down, and Jesus went around and washed every one of their feet. And so when he had finished washing their feet, he put back on his clothes and returned to his place. and said, do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for this is what I am. Uh, let's talk about those two words for a second. Uh, those are words that we see, and they don't maybe pack the same punch that they would have 2,000 years ago. Teacher and Lord. Uh, so first, teacher. Uh, anyone who's been around church for a while, anyone know what the, the word teacher would have been in a Jewish context? Uh, what, what, they wouldn't have said the word teacher. They would have said the word Rabbi, very good. Uh, and so a rabbi was a thing back then. There was lots of rabbis. There was lots of different teachers of the law. And so it was a very distinct thing for someone to decide, I want to be a student or I want to be a disciple of a certain rabbi. And to be a disciple of a rabbi didn't mean you just like read their book and then like, oh yeah, I'll take some of these ideas and apply it to their life. Uh, it wasn't just that you went to some of their lectures and tried to learn some things, but it was a matter of actually becoming a follower, a disciple of that rabbi. And so back in that day, you would see a rabbi walking down the streets and you would see a group of people behind them. Uh, sometimes it was as few as like two or three. Uh, there was one famous rabbi at the time who said to have 80 different disciples and they were following around and they would literally watch everything the teacher did, watch everything they said, listen to everything that the teacher ever taught because they didn't want to just like hear what the teacher had to say. They wanted to emulate. Uh, if, the, if the kind of teacher walked with this cadence, they were going to walk with this cadence. Uh, if the teacher woke up every day at 6 a.m., they were going to wake up at 6 a.m. Their idea was that they wanted to be a copycat of that person. I don't want to just know what they know. I want to live like they live. Uh, again, there was lots of different teachers in that day, but these disciples where you had to kind of pick who's going to be the disciple that you're going to follow. Who's di different disciples, uh, different rabbis had different interpretations of what the scripture was. And are you going to take this rabbi or are you going to take this rabbi? And so these disciples were saying that this is the rabbi that we are going to follow. We're going to follow what he says about God. We're going to follow what he says about the Bible. And we are going to try to learn what he is, is teaching us. And we're going to try to live like him. Uh, and then the other one, Lord. Uh, Lord, uh, you can think of like, as like a boss. You could think of as like president. Someone's like in charge. Uh, but in that day, they would have had a very clear understanding of what Lord was. Um, they could have maybe uh, all pulled a coin out of their robe or whatever they had. And it would have been an inscription on that coin. Uh, and the phrase would have been, Caesar is Lord. My wife knows. You get, yeah. Huh. Way, to, way to go. Uh, Caesar is Lord. That, that was the, the phrase around Rome at that point, was there is a Lord. There is someone who is large and in charge, and whatever Caesar says, whatever a Lord says, that's what you better do. If Caesar says you're going to give this amount of taxes, you're going to give that amount of taxes. If Caesar says this is the, the, the holiday you guys are all going to celebrate, if Caesar says you're going to be in the army, if Caesar says we're all going to go and attack, whatever the Lord says, that's what you're going to do. And this group of people was saying, I, I don't actually think Caesar is Lord. I think that Jesus is Lord. Uh, this is such an important point, two kind of visuals for this. And so uh, first, uh, for the idea of teacher. Uh, yeah, see, there's a few like 1980s kids in here. Uh, so uh, when I was a kid, the big deal was Michael Jordan. He was a basketball player, uh, if anyone doesn't know. And there was a, a, a kind of commercial uh, strategy thing uh, by Gatorade. 
and the, the catchphrase was, be like Mike. And the idea was that Michael Jordan was the greatest basketball player ever. And so, if you wanted to also be a great basketball player, it wasn't just enough to like kind of watch him. And kind of, you had to do the things that Michael Jordan did. And so somehow, if you wore the shoes, if you had the right outfit on, if you like watched his little video and did the drills that he did, and especially if you drank what he drank, then maybe you could become like him. Uh, and I don't think that was actually true. Uh, I drank a lot of Gatorade, and I was a terrible, am a terrible basketball player. But this was the idea of, of a rabbi and a teacher, was that if you do the things that I'm doing, then you can be like me. Uh, and this is probably not like the greatest picture, but this is the one that like literally pops in my mind. Whenever I think about the idea of Lord, this is the kind of phrase from a movie that pops in. This is from the movie Forrest Gump. Uh, I don't know if you remember this part of the movie, uh, but I think this is like, Gump, what's your sole purpose in this army? To do whatever you tell me, drill sergeant. Is it, that's, that is the idea of there's someone who has that much authority that I'm going to literally do whatever they say. Uh, and this is what Jesus claims. You call me teacher and Lord. And so these group of disciples that are around him, they want to learn uh, what, this, they, what that um, the rabbi knows. They want to listen to what they say. They want to watch what they do. And they want to apply it fully to my life, which is a really big claim to make about yourself or someone else. But Jesus owns this. So you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. That's what I am. I'm, I'm taking it. I am your rabbi. You should watch me and follow me to see how to do life. I am your Lord. Whatever I tell you to do, that's what you should do. Uh, he goes on. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set for you an example that you should do as I have done. Watch what I do because I'm your teacher and because I'm your rabbi and because I'm, said, I'm giving you a command here, because I am your teacher, because I'm your Lord. I wash feet, that means that you wash feet. And now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. If you do the things that you have seen me do, if you listen to the things that I want you to do, that is the key to living a blessed, eternal life life in the heavens kind of way. Uh, now here's the kind of next level of the question. Uh, is for the last couple of weeks we've said, we've been talking about the idea of the cross. And so if the cross is about something that Jesus has done on our behalf, what does it mean for us if we decide that we are going to make Jesus our teacher and our rabbi? And if we are going to make Jesus our Lord, then what does it mean to follow a teacher and Lord who died on a cross? If part of what we talked about last week is that at the cross, God demonstrated his own love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If that's what our teacher and Lord and rabbi did, then what does that mean for us? And the good news or potentially really difficult, life-changing, uh, going to ask you to live incredibly counterculturally kind of news, is that we don't have to guess. Uh, there's a guy by the name of John, 2,000 years ago, who was one of these guys who followed Jesus around everywhere he went. We've been looking at his words for the last couple of weeks, saying that he wrote these things down so that we would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. And John tells us exactly, he wrote a letter called the letter of 1 John, and in there he tells us exactly what it looks like for a group of people who are interested in believing in Jesus as Lord and Rabbi, a Jesus who died on a cross. He tells us exactly what that means for us. Here's what he says. He says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. This is what God has done for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If you 
are a follower of Jesus, then what it means to believe in a Jesus that died on the cross is that we need to follow him in that same pursuit. Oh, the cross, when we celebrate communion each week, uh, I think it should symbolize at least a couple key things to us. We should remember as we take communion that our sins are forgiven. That no matter what you have done in your life, you could have done the worst possible thing. You could have killed his own son, dragged him through the streets, spit in his face, made him suffocate on a cross, and even then, God would still forgive you. When we take communion, we should see that God has given us a path forward where we don't have to keep sinning. We can actually be transformed. And when we take communion, we should see that this is an example of how we are supposed to live our lives, that we are supposed to be people that love in that kind of a deep, sacrificial way. And so what does that look like? Uh, Well, John continues for us. Uh, John says, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. According to John, what does it look like to follow a Lord and rabbi that died for us? Uh, for starters, he says, let's look at your money. If the cross represents a self-sacrificial way of loving other people, then if you want to be a follower of Jesus, then you should be someone who looks at your money in such a way and says, do I have any extra? Do I have any extra ability? And if I see someone in need, then I am going to live in a very different way. And I'm going to live and love not just with speech, but with actions. A uh, couple kind of practical uh, things with this. So I put all kinds of junk on your guys' uh, chairs today. Uh, so uh, one, we, there's a bless sheet that might be on there. Uh, we've talked about this a lot over the last two years. And the idea with this is, is that God has put all of you in some sort of a place for a reason. You, you have an apartment, you have a house, you work somewhere, and you are around people. And part of the reason why you are there is to love the people around you, not just with words, but with actions. And so what would it look like for you to become someone who is loving the people around you with actions? Uh, These seem like a little bit maybe under the idea of dying for somebody on the cross, but I think for some of us, they might still be pretty darn, I don't know, self-sacrificial. What would it look like for you to start regularly praying for a few people that you live around? To make it a regular practice in your life, that you pick a few people that you work with, and you make the time in your life to regularly pray for them. What if you were to free up enough time in your life where you could really listen to the people around you? What if you opened up your home in such a way where you were inviting other people for hospitality, where you were making time to serve other people? I bet it might cause you to re- have to readjust some different things in your life. It might readjust your calendar. It might readjust the way in which you spend your money. It might readjust what is most important to you. Netflix, my family, my friends. What would that look like? Um, next week, uh, we have a uh, egg hunt that we are doing. So for our Sunday service, we're going to be uh, doing an egg hunt. And part of the reason why we're doing this, is that me or is that you, Ferran? Pay no attention to the man with the clicker. Uh, and part of the reason why we're doing this is that we, we love our city. We talk about it all the time. We, we love the people that are around us. And we want to not just, I could stick my head out the door and just, I love Albany! And that's something. Uh, but we want to love them not just with words. We want to love them with deeds. And so part of the reason why we're doing this is that we want to physically show that we love kids. We love families. We want to love the people around them. Um, 
But I would encourage all of us to maybe think about taking it up a notch. Uh, so on the, the back of the postcard there, there's a list. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different uh, nonprofits. And so next week, there'll be uh, 20 or more different booths that are there. And one of the things that's true of every single one of these organizations is they are doing amazing things to, to show love to the people in our city. And every single one of them desperately needs volunteers, and they all need money. And here's what I know about every single person sitting in this room. You have money that you could give to those organizations. And you have time that you could give to those organizations. It might not be readily apparent right now because you might have to reprioritize how some of your money is currently being deployed. You might have to look at how your calendar is being redone. But if you wanted to, you could make a decision that I am going to find a way that I am going to serve other people in a really radical way. Uh, or maybe it's not something that kind of fits into that category. Uh, we have uh, our prayer. We'll talk about this a little bit more in a bit. But as you look through uh, the prayer, there's something that as we pray through this on a, on a weekly basis, that if you take time, there's something in here that just kind of like stops you a little bit in your tracks. Because you know if you're going to lean in to that part of following Jesus, it would cause you to have to surrender, to change, to sacrifice, to at some level put something to death on a cross. That would be very, very hard for you. But you feel like that maybe God is calling you to live in a very different way. Because what Jesus calls us to is when he calls us to live a life that is following him. What sometimes we often kind of fall in the trap of is we try to kind of add Jesus into our normal life. Uh, so we have kind of start coming to church and I, I got my stuff, I got my work and here's my budget and here's my vacation plans and here's the things I want to do with my family. We kind of have all these things. And then we start hearing about this life of Jesus and, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm supposed to rest, I'm supposed to love people, and I'm supposed to be generous, and I'm supposed to serve other people. And it's like, yeah, I, that all sounds great. And so let me see if I can kind of fit that into the rest of my life. So I'm going to keep all this stuff, and now I want to try to add the Jesus stuff. And I think part of what Jesus means by us starting to follow him as someone who self-sacrificed on a cross is that we take our normal life and we say, it's all kind of up for up end now. And I'm willing to radically change everything in my life so that I can follow you as teacher and Lord. Uh, here's a couple examples. Uh, one day, uh, a teacher of the law came up to him, uh, came up to Jesus and said, teacher, rabbi, yeah, I get it. I get what you're trying to do. I get you're trying to be this whole rabbi thing. And so I will follow you wherever you go. And that's the hope of all of us, is that we get to that point. We're holding our hands open. We're holding our hands up. We're surrendering God wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do. And Jesus says, well, here's the deal. Uh, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head you follow me, I, I, I'm a homeless guy. Are you willing to follow me if this really upsets your current living condition? If God was to ask you to follow him in such a way where it would affect the level of comfort in which you are living, if it made you downsize the kind of house that you lived in, downsize the kind of car that you drive, uh, if it was to seriously affect are we willing to follow Jesus even there? Uh, next one. So when Jesus saw... Is that me? Am I good now? That ain't good. Anything I can do about that, or is that...
Uh, here's another one. Uh, it said, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders, because again, this is what a Lord does, orders to his disciples, uh, to cross to the other side of the lake. And then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him because that's, that's what disciples do. Lords give orders, teachers do example, and disciples follow. And suddenly, a ferocious storm came up on the lake. Uh, and so Jesus asked his disciples to get into a boat and go to the other side of the lake. And so one of the things we believe about God is we believe God is all-powerful. God kind of knows all. And so God's not ever surprised by anything. And so this means that Jesus asked a group of disciples, ordered a group of disciples to get into a boat, knowing full well that they are about to go straight into a ferocious storm. Sometimes we can paint a picture that if you're going to follow Jesus, then you're going to follow Jesus. But Jesus is going to make everything just like kind of rosy and work out everything fine. And, and Jesus will never lead us into something very difficult. But now Jesus is asking his disciples to get into a boat, ordering his disciples to get into a boat, knowing they are going straight into a ferocious storm. If God is calling you to go in a certain direction, and you feel like this feels like it's going to be really difficult. And you see God kind of nod his head like, oh, it's going to be ferocious. This is going to be really hard. What does it look like to follow Jesus into the midst of that? Uh, it kind of goes like up a notch, so a little uh, Bible geography for you. And so this is the sea that they're crossing that Jesus is asking them to go across. And they are in Galilee, and it's kind of the sea there and a the river there. And on the other side is the Decapolis. And uh, we, we kind of have this like a lot in our world where there's kind of these like groups of people that live on kind of like different areas and there's like different regions that like where it's just it's very segmented and so uh today is saint patrick's day and so you know we think of you know our friends in ireland and you know there's different neighborhoods where it's like there's different groups it's like you don't cross from this side to that Th those people live over here these people live over here um continue to pray for our friends in, uh, in Palestine and Gaza and Israel. And I mean, there's kind of these clear, you know, marks of like, this is where these people live and this is where these people live. And, and sometimes it's even like a little like less defined. And so uh, Ashley and I moved into the city of Albany uh, from Gildeland back in 2009. And uh, just some Gildeland folks here. So I love Gildeland folks. Uh, but it's kind of interesting when we lived in Gildeland and we were telling people we're going to move from Gildeland into Albany, uh, there was some Gildan folks that are like, oh, like, are you sure? Like, do, do you know, like, what the schools are like in Albany? And, like, I mean, they, I always, you know, like, that scene of, like, Back to the Future 2, uh, you know, and, like, there's the scene where they go back to, like, the weird 1985. Some of you are totally missing this. And there's, like, a scene where, like, they're going through with, like, there's people, on, like, on the back of trucks and everything's on fire. Like, that was, like, the picture, I think, of folks in Gildan of, like, what Albany was going to be like. And, we're working on it. It's, we're, we're, we're getting it there. Uh, but there's kind of like, oh, like, why would you ever, like, go there? And then we moved into, into Albany, and we'd start to talk to some friends there. And we said, oh, because we were still, like, going up to Gilderland quite a bit. And they're like, you go to Gilderland? Like, you know, hey, we, we're, we're going to go to the mall. Like, oh, you go to the mall? Like, the, there's things that are, like, not local and organic there. Like, you know, that's where, you know, those suburban sellouts go. You know, why are you ever going? And sometimes there's, like, these lines of, like, those kind of people. And that was very much this idea of, like, Jewish, kind of, this is like the folks who lived over in Galilee, these kind of very religious people who kind of follow these very distinct rules. And then over there are kind of these like Greek, you know, all these, you know, pagan worshiping people over there in the Decapolis. And now here's Jesus intentionally taking them to a place that they were always told, I'm not supposed to go to those kind of neighborhoods. What if God calls you to go to a group of people maybe to a neighborhood that isn't the place where you normally would go. Maybe you've even told, I, I, those kind of people are, are the sinful people. Those are the kind of people that are far away from God. But God asks you that those are the people you're supposed to intentionally go and build a relationship with. What does it look like to follow God in every single part of your life? To not just make him someone that we remember something that he has done for us, but to remember that Jesus is our teacher and our Lord. That religion is not just about a bunch of stuff that we are supposed to do. 
And Christianity is also not just about remembering something that has been done for us and now we can go do whatever we want. But the Christian message is that we have been invited to become followers of Jesus. Uh, we've been looking, uh, yeah, Jesus, Christianity, I think that's how it's spelled, is follow. You are invited to follow Jesus in every single way. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, uh, we've been looking at this passage uh, from uh, the Apostle John. Uh, and this is why John says that he took this time to write down the things of Jesus. Is he wanted us to believe. He wanted us to at some point put our trust in God that he really is Messiah, that he really is King, that he is the Son of God, not Caesar, that he is the one we should follow. Uh, and so here's kind of a question I want to put out to everybody as we uh, come to a close today. Where are you kind of at in that process of putting your trust completely in Jesus? Uh, and there's a part of this that I really believe is a daily process. That's why we talk about this prayer of intent, that it's kind of every single day there's this kind of like re-up of like, what does it look like today for me to follow you? What does it look like for me today to choose to make you my teacher? Today to choose my Lord? Uh, and that's a really, really good thing. It's something that we all have to do. But there's also kind of like a, a step in there uh, that we don't talk about all the time, but it's on your program. Uh, there's a, all these little check marks that you can do to kind of say, like, here's a, maybe a step I've been thinking about. And, and one of those steps that we have on there is a step that we call baptism. And so you might notice, like, we kind of leave our baptistry tank up there all the time. And the idea of baptism is that it's, we totally welcome the idea of, like, exploring. That's what I love about this passage of John. Because John says, I, I, I wrote these things down, and I want you to take a look. Take a hard look. Explore. Ask questions. And, like, really look at what this whole Jesus thing is about. But at some point, you might come to a decision that, you know what, I really want to be someone who, like, this is the direction in which I'm leaning with my life, is I want to be someone who believes. Uh, we often use the analogy uh, of marriage, uh, is that at some point, those of you who have been uh, uh, married before, or you've been to a wedding, nothing really magical happens at a wedding. It's not like, oh, I really fell in love with you the day of our wedding, you know, or I'm so much more in love with you the day after the wedding than I was before the wedding. No. It's just a point in time where you say, okay, I, we were kind of dating, and that was nice, you know, you know but like, I, 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 was, I wasn't committing too much yet because I wanted to have options, you know. And then, and then even like once we got engaged, like, you know, we'll see kind of how it goes. But now it's one where I'm standing up in front of a group of people and saying, I'm going to have to cut keep re-upping this thing. This is not a matter of like, okay, we say our vows and it's like, all right, you know, oh, peace out. It, marriage is something you have to decide every single day that you want to continue to live this way. But there's a point where you say, I'm going to stand in front of a group of people and say, I'm going to make a decision that I want to live my life. I, I, there's a lot of teachers. There's a lot of people I can make my Lord. I am intentionally choosing Jesus to be my teacher and Lord. Uh, and some of you, uh, this fellow, I want to push this a little bit today. You've been in service for a while now. You've been looking at the words that, that John and others wrote down about Jesus. And you've been kind of feeling this move of maybe like, I want Jesus to be my teacher and Lord. I want to follow him. And maybe that's a step. Uh, if you click that, we'd love to follow up with you. For others of you, uh, it's just a matter of like following Jesus in maybe a way that you've been pushing off that is just so countercultural and big, but you've just felt for a while that Jesus is asking you to adjust your money, your time, your calendar in a way to not just make him someone that you're thankful that he died for you, but where you are following in his footsteps. Uh, what the last couple weeks? The message of Jesus is that God so loved the world that he gave his son and whoever believes puts his, your trust, decides that they want to follow him. 
will have a completely different life because they will not have a life that's going towards death and going towards hell, but it's a life that is going towards eternal life right now. And we're painted exactly kind of what that looks like for us to put that belief in, is that if we know what love is, then we will know that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and that we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Uh, I wanna give you a moment to reflect. And what I'd like you to do is, uh, so on most of your chairs, there should be that uh, prayer of daily intent, uh, or if you're um, watching online, uh, it's a link uh, that you can click on the weekly email for, a, uh, I just wanna give you a few moments and you can just read through those prayers and try to pinpoint what are maybe a few of those words that just kind of like sting your heart and your life today, where you feel like maybe God is calling you to take a bigger step of what it looks like to follow a Jesus who laid down his life for us and what it might look like for you then to lay down your life for someone else. Uh, take a few moments. Uh, and just reflect and just kind of, maybe you have a pen, even maybe like circle a word, like what, how is God calling you to follow today? Uh, take a few moments.